Green joins Winter Circle. Caribbean College Course on DIP. Face-to-face -face fun approaches. I'm David Hood of the Diplomacy Broadcast Network, and this is Deadline, DBN's monthly news program. Deadline, July 2021. For our feature story, the diplomacy hobby has been an international one from the very beginning, with the zines of the early days being published from and sent to hobbyists living in various parts of the world. Postal and online games have for decades featured competitors from various countries, and the World Dipcon face-to-face -face tournament has rotated among various local and national tournaments since 1988. With the recent advent of virtual face-to-face -face play in 2020, it is now even easier to interact with hobbyists overseas. Later in the program, we will air a panel discussion about the current cosmopolitanism of the diplomacy hobby featuring three players based in Europe. But first, a look at headlines from around the world of diplomacy. The 2021 edition of the Diplomacy Tournament Boston Massacre was held virtually on June 26th and the wee morning hours of the 27th local time. And this year, Farron Jane of Texas took first place. Farron burst on the diplomacy scene during the 2020 lockdown, reaching the top boards of both the Virtual World Diplomacy Classic and the DBN Invitational. The massacre win took place in spectacular fashion as the players in Farron's last game voted for a conceded solo as France. The field in that game included the first and second place finishers from the virtual tournament right before massacre, Karthik Conneth and Ed Sullivan, and that just highlights Farron's accomplishment. Saren Kwok from the United Kingdom came in second, with Morgan Pell of Vermont coming in third. And then coming up next in tournament diplomacy, it's the Summer Classic, to be played virtually on the VWDC Discord server, with five preliminary rounds on July 23rd, and a top board for the championship on July 25th. The Euro Dipcon in the Republic of San Marino is also right around the corner, August 25th through 27th. There are details about these events in the description field below the broadcast. For decades, the World Board Gaming Championships has hosted the Diplomacy Tournament. Other than DixieCon, this event is probably the longest running yearly diplomacy tournament in the world. Unfortunately, COVID has again canceled the convention itself, which would otherwise have been held later this month in Seven Springs, Pennsylvania. Fortunately, the Board Game Players Association, the nonprofit which runs the WBC, has an extended deadline tournament that it runs on play diplomacy, and it's looking for us in the wider diplomacy hobby to join. GM Kevin Ewells has announced the details for this year's online event, which will involve two games running concurrently with 48-hour deadlines and using the C. Diplo scoring system with a hard stop in winter 1910 in each game. It is long past time for our hobby to rejoin the WBC in force, not only to compete in the diplomacy tournament, but also to recruit more general board gamers into our virtual and face-to-face -face circuits. Do your part by joining this year's Play Dip tournament using the link provided below. Just think, folks, if you had gone to college at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus, which is on Trinidad and Tobago, you could have fulfilled a diplomacy player's student dream, a university-level class about the game of diplomacy itself. Dr. Michael Powinski of the University's Institute of International Relations offers course number INRL 6103 entitled Diplomacy and Strategy Wargaming Simulation, in which the only required resource material is access to the game of diplomacy. Recommended readings include books and articles on body language, negotiation theory, and the history of international relations. The 14-person class plays two full boards over the course of the semester, every other Saturday for a full eight hours of play, along with times for discussion and analysis. One can only hope that two boards of Caribbean players will start invading the next World Dipcon. A link to his course outline can be found below. 
If you like league play as part of your diplomacy experience, you should be on cloud nine these days. The Tour of Britain continues its virtual march around the British Isles with the third and fourth rounds of the eight round event having been played on June 12th. And this was covered in some detail in DBN's League Night program, which aired on Saturday, July 10th. Halfway through the Tour of Britain, the top three spots are all currently held by Americans, believe it or not. Morgante Pella Vermont is in the lead with Ohio's Evan Swihart in second and Katie Gray of Indiana in the third position. Also covered in that league night broadcast, six games in the Virtual Diplomacy League over three rounds featuring players from all over Europe and North America. After all that diplomacy action, the current standings still show McCullis Camarites of the UK in first, and then Morgante Pell in second, and DBN's own Brandon Fogel charging into third. You can catch all of this league action right here on the DBN YouTube channel. Face-to-face -face action in North America is back. The 2021 carnage in Mount Snow, Vermont on November 5th and 6th was announced some time ago, with hobbyists from all over already planning to make the trip. Tournament director Dave Maletsky suggests coming in that Thursday night for the unofficial welcoming meal and then staying through the award ceremony scheduled for the Sunday morning, the 7th. And now Liberty Cup joins the face-to-face -face schedule with TD Bill Hackenbrack having just announced that tournament's live return to be held over the weekend of October 8th through 10th at the Hilton Doubletree in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Each tourney held their 2020 events virtually, but the times they are a changing. More information on these exciting opportunities for real live face-to-face -face play are available at the links described in the description field below. Let's take a trip around the various websites and YouTube channels for the content providers, which we call our DBN media partners. Diplomacy Briefing recently produced a special Patreon edition of its newsletter. In addition to the outstanding issues, you can count on every Friday like clockwork. Become a Patreon while you visit diplomacybriefing.com and you can check out that special Patreon edition. It includes the original Eddie Bersan Lepanto article, advice on Turkish strategy, and a report on a 2016 virtual game played in Sweden. Also, Florida Man recently dropped a fascinating July 4th episode on his YouTube channel called Strategic Maxims of Benjamin Franklin, which uses Franklin's sage advice to inform diplomacy theory. Legendary Tactics has completed its series on the play of each of the seven great powers by dropping an episode on YouTube about the play of Russia, featuring an interview with the 2021 Diplomat of the Year, Australia's own Peter McNamara. You can check out these content creators and all of our other media partners on the media page of the North American Diplomacy Federation website, thenadf.org. The finals of Season 6 of Extended Deadline Play on the Nexus Discord server continues. As reported in last month's deadline, Nexus is the place for online players to compete against each other regardless of their preferred platform. Since Nexus games are hosted on web diplomacy, play diplomacy, backstabber, duplicity, and conspiracy. So far, the action in this top board has not disappointed. Each turn of the game is being featured in an episode of the Diplomats podcast series on YouTube, which is hosted by Ed Sullivan and has commentators who are known online as Stitches and Hand. As of this recording, this final game has reached fall 1903, with the England of Riaz Varani making a big move against German centers, while the Austria of Pez de Mer and the Russia of Ewok struggle for supremacy in the East. Go to www.thediplomats.net to catch up on this game's moves. And while you're there, you can check out all their other episodes, which are listed by topic on their website. Issue 154 of the quarterly magazine Diplomacy World was published online on July 1st. Editor Doug Kent packed this edition of the hobby's flagship publication with tournament reports, from the Whipping, E-Carnage, and Dixiecon events, 
including a retrospective of, from Jonathan Frank about the new version of the Carnage scoring system that he designed for use at that eCarnage spring edition that ha happened back a few months ago. Also featured in this issue of Diplomacy World, a hobby history piece about the word press in its original and online meanings, a rundown of current nicknames for various alliances, and an interview about the just completed Boston Massacre with first-time tournament director Alex Maslow. To download this latest DW, visit www.diplomacyworld.net. And now it's time for a segment we call My Favorite Things. We'll interview a diplomacy player about why that player likes playing a particular power or alliance on the board, and then talk about something of particular interest to that hobbyist, whether or not related to diplomacy. This month, we feature Russ Dennis, also known online as Umble the Heap. Hello, Russ Dennis. Hello, David. Deadline viewers probably already know who you are because they've run across you, you know, in the hobby before. But just in case, if you could give us a brief diplomacy bio, that would be great. So I started playing diplomacy in 2008. And basically in college, I got I uh, was playing Risk with different people and just was interested if there was any other game that was similar, that had maybe a little more strategy to it. And uh, Diplomacy was one of the games that came up. And as I looked into it more, and especially the nego negotiation side, I, I, I just was like, this is the perfect game for me. And the DP judge was actually what I um, connected with first to be able to play and played there for a few years, was able to go to a face-to-face -face tournament, but then took a break for really five years. And when I got back into the hobby back in 2018, um, what uh, I, I connected with Nexus. And so that's kind of who I, I uh, played uh, online games with and then started the briefing in 2019. And um, then um, that's just uh, really grown. We have 900 subscribers and followers. And uh, we have a, a, a team of six people that work on it. And then, you know, we, we just love uh, the hobby and the hobby's just been very, very supportive. And so um, that's probably my biggest connection. I also co-founded The Diplomats with Ed Sullivan. And um, we like talking about the different games that we're in and uh, other games that are going on. Yeah, you're, there's really a lot of great content out there uh, mm -hmm. that you've been involved in. And I appreciate that. You are particularly known as a player for your skill and interest in, in playing England. So mm -hmm. why does Britannia rule as far as you're concerned? Well, I, I tend to do well with England and uh, I think it suits um, skill sets that um, maybe tactically there's some creativity that, um, that you may have. And really that's because of the, um, the of all the different convoys you can do and the different waterways, you know, more centers, um, neighbor the North Sea than any other. And so that gives you just a lot of options to make quick uh, changes even. Um, and then also uh, you really have, um, I, I think some really great negotiation pot potential with being able to ally with Russia, Germany, France, or Italy, and, and really kind of influence the whole side of the board. And so there's, I don't know, there's just a lot of different options and it just, it seems to suit me pretty well. And, um, I think that's that's particularly one reason I enjoy it. But I, I really do. I enjoy other countries, too. I just have had the most success with England. Is there a particular alliance structure that you like the best when you're England? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like anybody who will let me be their ally. So beyond that, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with any type of alliance structure. At my, my, I mean, if I can just find somebody that will leave me alone, that's that's great. You know, they don't even have to help me. <laughs> Just leave me alone. Uh, that's that's a good diplomacy game for me. And uh, so, yeah, I, I'm good with uh, really any alliance structure. And that's probably just another reason I, I feel um, I'm so comfortable with playing England in the different alliance structures that um, it just it makes it makes it, it easier for me. So, no, I mean, if you're on the board and I'm England, hey, you're, you're my number one friend. I want to be your ally. Very politic answer from Russ mm -hmm. Dennis. All right. So this is uh, part of a series on the show called My Favorite Thing. So we're focusing on something that the guest really enjoys outside 
the actual play of the game. So Umble the Heap, as you are known online, tell us something that you're really into right now. So recently um, I had the opportunity to stop at the Hoosier archives. And this was something that I've wanted to do for probably coming up on two years. When I um, started the briefing, really the second issue, we did a postal um, section where we, where we um, linked into some uh, old strategy articles from the past. And there's just so much content out there from um, that, that postal era that really, you know, primarily, you know, it was running there in the mid 60s into the mid 90s, I would say when it was the strongest. Um, and, and so that was the way that people really played diplomacy. And that was really how the hobby was organized. And what, what we enjoy today um, all flows from that time and all the effort that people put in to grow the diplomacy hobby. And so I'm um, going back into the archives and just reading some of the old issues um, I always enjoyed doing. And I heard about the Huger archives, which was a complete um, copy of every single zine that was ever published from, I think it was 1963 to 1978, plus with many more, but it was, everything was complete. And if you look back, I mean, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of zines. You can find them. Um, uh, a, a guy did, a, I, I think it was one of his doctoral um, dissertations, or maybe it was one of his theses, but on looking at and cataloging all of the zines. And um, it's, it's, it was a giant undertaking, but then Walt Buchanan actually collect, collected all of them. And, um, and so when he, um, he passed his collection on and just, you know, over time, it eventually resided um, at Bowling Green State University in Ohio and um and part of their part of their collection and so there it there it sat and there's no way to connect with it online they've not uploaded it so if you want to go and see things um you have to go there and there's all kinds of gaps in um what we have available right now uh, doug kent's done a great job um, making available a lot of issues that were in the po postal hobby um over at his site but um there's lots and lots of gaps and so I, my desire was to go to the future archives and make some scans of some zines that um, I had not read before. Well, obviously that, that kind of project has a lot of historical value and, and mm -hmm. archival value. Do you think it has value to us as players or hobbyists today? In other words, can we learn lessons about the game from the old zines? Um, so about the game in particular, uh, I mean, I, I don't know necessarily in particular. There's there's some interesting ideas that kind of were lost that, um, you know, that I, I that there there are some good ideas. But I think probably the biggest lesson that um, the hobby can take from that time period is how important it is to make sure that relations are are cordial at the very least. But 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 it would be better if they're warm among people that have influence in the hobby or that are organizing because um, over that time period, there were, um, there were different uh, schisms that happened that really affected um, just the ability of the, the hobby to grow. And so uh, diplomacy is not something we get paid to do. It's, um, it's something that we do as a passion project. And so there, there can be a lot of ego there. And so just a willingness to kind of say, you know, I'll put this aside for the good of the hobby, I think is really important. So I would think for me, at least, that's one of the biggest lessons from the archives, just the importance of striving to keep unity in the hobby so it can continue to go forward. Can we not just all get along? I think might right. be might be one right. way to put that. Well, um, you know, our, after having read some of the zines from the old days, and of course I'm old, so I actually remember some of that stuff firsthand, mm -hmm. but is there anything about the hobby in those days that you wish we could recreate now? You know, one of the things I, I really love about reading those uh, zines was just, there was a lot of creative output that was done during that time that, you know, just clever things written. Um, you know, one of my favorite, um, uh, zines of the past. And by the way, it's a great one just to kind of get a sense of other zines in the hobby was uh, the Diplomacy Digest by Mark Birch. That continues for me to be one of my favorites. Um, there weren't games in that particular zine. It was basically just 
you know, content. He would theme th theme um, around different issues, and he would take articles from other zines and publish them. And then he had editorials too. And so there's just a lot of creative editorial output. And um, it's not like these, you know, this these videos these days that you know they just just turn this stuff out. But I mean, like real creative output, like the briefing produces, for instance. And so more things like that would always be good. Um, going along with that too, though, you know, we've got two webzines that actually, uh, you know, they do games and they do all of, uh, you know, editorials and, and articles like that. Because the briefing's not really a zine. The, the briefing's more of kind of an update with some strategy articles. But um, I think, you know, having some more uh, zines um, would be great for the hobby. And there's really only two. And the, the thing is, too, it doesn't take nearly the amount of time to do zines today like it does in the past because you can just do it all online. Whereas before you had to type it up. You had to, uh, of course, do the printings. You have to do mailings. And um, it, I mean, it still takes some time, but it'd be great to see some people that would love to, you know, do some games, uh, human GM the games, you know, longer, longer deadlines, like a week maybe and uh, then just produce a, a really good issue. So I think that would be neat, but I really, really enjoy some of just the clever creative output that um, people people did during that time. Yeah, it's really true. Any other final thoughts for us, Russ, about, about your, uh, what I call zine history project, but you can call it whatever you want to. Well, I, I guess my final thought is, you know, I wanna give a special congratulation to you and the DBN crew for one year now of um, deadline episodes. I, it's just been great what you guys have done for the hobby. And it's really kind of, I think, um, lifted up the professionalism that our hobby has. And also, uh, I mean, there's 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 nothing like DBN that has ever happened in the hobby. And so it's, it's a great undertaking. I know it's kind of a, just a, a gift of love um, back to the diplomacy hobby, but thank you and congratulations for that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Russ. And thanks for being on the show. Thank you, David. Let's move now to our panel discussion about European perspectives on the current state of the diplomacy hobby. Joining me are Macarlis Kamarites from Brighton in England, also from England, London resident Saren Kwok, and Andre Janico, who lives just across the river from Lisbon in the country of Portugal. Welcome to Deadline. So let's start with you, Macarlis. Tell us your diplomacy origin story and then why you enjoy this game so much. All right. So I, as I was a child, I played a lot of um, strategy games. I sort of made my up through Age of Empires, Civilization, Total War Paradox games. And then I was around a, a friend's house and I saw a parent playing web diplomacy. And so instantly I see a map game, a strategy game. And that appeals to me and i'm like oh that looks fun so i'll go home i'll try that and i did and the first couple of years i sort of played it as a strategy game and did really not very well as a result and but over time i developed like an appreciation of the communication side and the reliability and what's important to get better at the game and then got a bit better at it and sort of worked my way up the rankings playing a lot of live games and eventually i moderated and administrated on web dip as well and then i took a bit of a break for a couple of years and before the vwdc last year uh, marcus zilstra and tanya deal encouraged me and a few other old web dippers to sign up and play for it and i enjoyed it a lot and yeah i've not really looked back since so that's been that's been really good as for what appeals it's i guess no game is ever the same like because the people are almost always completely different people and the personalities that will clash in one game but don't clash in another and there's just so many things you can do that it's it's got so much replayability that's yeah, really true how about you sarah how and why did you get into this game yeah so i got into the game uh during lockdown last year the first lockdown when i was uh, looking for something to do and um i'd been vaguely aware of like diplomacy as a game that uh existed for a long time before i started playing but I always thought um, it was too complicated for me to get into and I wouldn't be able to like pick up all the rules and everything. Um, but I started watching on YouTube um, Captain Meme or Marcus's videos as well. And um, 
I realized, okay, this is actually pretty interesting. And I think like it's not too difficult to pick up. So I just decided to give it a try myself. And um, my first tournament was a Liberty Cup last year. So I started playing because of the strategy, because I was um, attracted to all the different like strategic and tactical aspects. But I kept playing because of the people 100%. Um, you know, the people I've been able to meet in this community have been, uh, for the most part, wonderful. And here we are. Yeah, yeah here we are. Andre, how about you? Give us some diplomacy some background on you. Sure, David. So basically, a friend of mine presented me an article from Grantland. I think the article is from 2014. It's called the Board Game of the Alpha Nerds. But sometime, sometime after that, I read the article and I just was fascinated for the cutthroat ambience and environment that could be created by such a game. So I researched it and I tried to uh, get to play online, and that was uh, the way I started. Then there was a second thing regarding coverage that also brought me into being more aware of diplomacy, which was the coverage from Chris Martin on his YouTube channel for, I think, the 2016 WDC tournament. And that also opened my eye to how exactly such a game would uh, be uh, let's say on a first on a real face to face uh, environment be happening so because of that i did bought the game and started playing with some friends and it is really fascinating on a on a face to face play well st staying with you andre i know you you've been in the virtual face to face world from the very beginning which was last year's 2020 dixicon which was the first con we did that was completely virtual face to face so what do you think about how that mode of play has progressed? Sure. So after starting playing uh, online and casually with some friends, I started looking for a ways to do a, a tournament play. And I was really into trying to, to get a way to play face to face. And when the virtual scene appeared because of the pandemic, pandemic it, it just brought to me the possibility. I think actually there's uh, that idea for some people and even for me at the time in the sense of this was just a plan B in the sense of until we do get to play again in face to face and get to the real game, That's the, that will be the real game. Uh, but in the meanwhile, I think this grow this has grown in a, in a different way. So now we have people all around the world playing in this uh, community, which was not exactly possible this, uh, the same way before this. You also have bridged the, uh, let's say, uh, time gap in the sense of because of this, you can have league play and you can have uh, tournaments all, all almost all weekends because of this. And so that, that's really impressive. And, I think it has grown to something new. And the, one last thing, by the way, I think these coverages also brought a different dimension to, to diplomacy play. And I guess it was a consequence of, uh, again, uh, people that came from face to face wanting to get more proximity. And because of that, they, it, it was created something different. It's true. Um, all right. Well, that's a good segue, Michalis. Let me talk to you about league play because you have had particular success lately, both in the Tour of Britain and in Virtual Diplomacy League. Is there anything about league play, you know, virtual face-to-face -face league play that you find particularly attractive? Um, well, one big thing is that league play, I think, offers a level playing field for all participants. Like the, the tournaments, I've played in quite a few of the one-off tournaments as well, but generally they're hosted by North Americans and most of the time zones have been like beneficial for North Americans. It's been quite difficult. I don't live alone. I can't play all through the night. So I play like one game at Cascadia, one game at Whipping, one at E-Carnage. And generally, you're not going to win a tournament if you only play in one game. So lead play, because the VDL in particular is really good at just leveling that playing field. It's got a game that's pretty much in the middle of the night for me, which is for the Australians and that side of the world. It's got the game in the middle of the day, which I generally play, which is for Europeans. And it's got a game in the evening, which is for the North Americans. And I think that that is, is, it's obviously good that pretty much everyone in the world has a chance to be able to play in a game. And if you're playing in a league, you only need to play that one game that weekend and you've still got a chance of doing well in the tournament overall. And so that, I think, definitely is one of the more appealing things. And I know some of the tournaments, I wasn't available to play in the Virtual Massacre, but that did have the whole uh, games for everyone. It, it had gone for international players being encouraged. And I think some of the ones coming up, like the 
summer classic uh have said that they're also going to do that so that also is quite good because i think if you just look at the vdl standings it's obviously i've had quite a lot of success there but i had a look uh yesterday at the top 20 and i think about eight of the top 20 at least are non-north americans so you can just see just from that how it's a really global experience and also watching on the dbn streams you can see so many different play styles and i think that that's it's, it enriches the experience for everyone the players the viewers the, even the tournament directors yeah that's totally true uh, and, and again a good segue into me asking saren about the massacre because um you know saren you you just came off an impressive second place finish at the virtual boston massacre just a few weeks ago tell us what it is like to play from england in a North American tournament with mostly North American players using mostly North American time zones. Yeah, as um as Michaelis just said, there's definitely challenges in like playing through the middle of the night, even when um even when your living situation makes this possible, as mine does. Um, even though Boston Massacre had like um European morning round, like I was actually working that morning, so I played the later two rounds, including the one um in the middle of my night, <laughs> and so by the last round I was uh, pretty fatigued, and um I was just grateful to take whatever I can get, and I found that that's like been something that's fairly common within these tournaments when I'm playing in the middle of the night. Like usually in the later North American rounds, um, I draw sooner than I would like during the day, during my day, I mean, during the earlier rounds. Um, I don't really have the ability or the energy by that point to like grind out the entire board, even though like sometimes I would try to go for that if I were playing like during my day. It's occasionally been a diplomatic disadvantage. Um, there was one game I remember where like a neighbor once told me after the game that they had um, attacked me in 1901 because um, they thought I seemed quite out of it compared to the other possible alliance partner. So they didn't think I would make as reliable of an ally. Um, that game ended up going okay for me in the end. So it's it's not really like a debilitating disadvantage, but like it does have the caveat of me knowing that like, okay, this game is probably not going to like, I'm probably not going to be able to like really fight this to the bitter end. So like, I feel like there is a slight bit of ceiling as a result of like playing from a different time zone for me anyway. Yeah, I think it's it's sort of a happenstance in some ways that the tournaments, the one-off tournaments that you've described have been held in North America. It's because North America simply had a bunch of pre-existing face-to-face tournaments and those GMs, those tournament directors sort of morphed it into a virtual setting. And that unfortunately has no longer been true in Europe. It used to be true in Europe that there were a bunch of tournaments. And I'm hoping that once face-to-face gets back going again, that, that that can go back to the way it was, both within the UK, which is what, you know, where a lot of tournaments were, and also in continental Europe. Sarah, l- let me stay with you. Uh, have you found any significant differences in negotiation style or strategic thinking or anything else as between players based in Europe versus players based in other parts of the world? Um. I would be hesitant to make any like large generalizations because my I recognize that like my sort of experience playing um, in these virtual games is still like comparatively extremely limited. I haven't really gotten the chance at all to play like with players from the French hobby, which I know is like these days, like I guess the most active European hobby with like its own distinct meta and community. Um, I think it would be too much of a generalization. So for me to say that like as a group, players from Europe have like a different style than players from like America or Australia, especially as there's like so much individual variation as well um, between individual players within each of those groups. Um, I will say that um, for me, it's personally not as much of an issue because I'm from a very international background that in some ways makes me like, you know, um, more used to and more like able to build up a rapport with like American than European players even. But I have noticed like from talking to some um, non-North American players that like there's a bit of like a cultural or linguistic barrier in terms of like um, establishing those super solid like personality grounded alliances as opposed to like speaking like to someone like in the same uh, linguistic and cultural background. And um, it does make sort of negotiations there slightly more um, strategic or like uh, slightly more utilitarian as opposed to the way that like you might be able to like build up like a really good relationship with someone like if you're all speaking like from the same sort of background. But I don't think that's really like due to a preference of the players so much as like a constraint of like just the language that we have to play in. 
Yeah, and plus we're not all as cosmopolitan as Saren Kwok is, and so we're we're at a disadvantage in relation to Saren, which I think is true. Uh, um, well, uh, I know that um, you all will probably want to be joining in some some face to face action, some actual live face to face action in European tournaments when you can. Michaelis, let me ask you this: What are you looking forward to most in that regard? Well, I was talking to Dave Maletsky the other day, and he was uh, talking about hosting a tournament in Port Merion in North Wales, which, as you've already mentioned, like the tournament scene in Britain isn't that great at the moment. It's like I know it used to be quite good in the past, but at least since I've been playing, I don't think it's been a particularly big thing. But of course, Dave Maletsky is a known uh, tournament director experience from carnage and he was uh, talking about hosting it with someone else who's based in britain and that would really appeal it also didn't mean it's used to go to north wales because i've only ever been to the south there so andre you have been active in trying to organize and promote diplomacy play in the portuguese and spanish languages so tell our viewers a little bit more about that initiative if you would Sure, David. I'm going to count on you to put the link to the VWDC server uh, in the in below this this video, because that's that will be much part of this initiative. So first of all, let me thank the VWDC team of creating the server itself the way it is, because it just joins too many communities or a lot of communities, both the tournament scene, the 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 the, the, the league scene, but also the casual play and the master classes and all that. So it does allow for uh, different and a broader uh, range of people uh, joining together. And in this sense, the, the, the possibility that this is now created to join the Portuguese and Spanish uh, spoken, uh, speaking people around the world. So uh, there will be people speaking Spanish and Portuguese all around the world that locally do not have enough people to go into the scene uh, by themselves and by this initiative are now in the possibility to, to, uh, to join them together and let's have casual play let's have the possibility to give a step into other kinds of play so that's that that will be it well i i, th I think all of us would say i hope that works out i think that's a would be a great addition to have some some play uh being organized in different languages including spanish and portuguese well, Saren, let me go to you for uh, final thoughts for our audience about the current state of the diplomacy hobby from your perspective. Yeah, David, I feel like um, I've joined I've joined the diplomacy hobby at like the right time. I don't think there was like sort of a better time in the history of the community that um, I could have really chosen to start playing from um, talking to people who've been like around for a very long time. It seems that like the hobby is currently in a very healthy state at the moment when it comes to um, both in terms of our uh, player growth and retention and in like the culture of the hobby and the, of the community really. Um, I, I really like how virtual has had um, diversifying effects in so sort of in like bringing um, a lot of people from different backgrounds into the hobby and like widening the access in that regard, as well as in um, bringing the sort of different online communities together, like sort of um, Nexus and web diplomacy and like the virtual face-to-face -face hobby all feel very integrated in a way that I don't think they would have like a couple of years ago. So that's been really nice. It's true. Andre, same question to you from your perch in Lisbon. Como estas coisas? Something like that. How are they, how, what's happening? Well, let's say that at this moment in Portugal, we, I'm still trying to get things going with the more casual play. So that's bringing people to under, to know the, the, the game and, and bring them to the game. And the, again, the, the VWDC uh, Discord server community will help a lot on that uh, because it doesn't need always to be a tournament scene, right, to play uh, diplomacy. So let me give you one minute of an example. I've played with people that just enjoy to be the peacekeepers of the world. And that's that's it. So they wouldn't allow anyone to conquer and or they will punish them so <laughs> anyone enjoys them the, the, the way they do so that's the the state where we are and giving some steps forward all right last word to you mccallus the hellenic riot that you are this is your chance to tell the rest of us in the world just exactly what you think about all this diplomacy business i, I think it's really good like I took my couple of years of break from the game. I had gone to the WDC in Oxford a few years ago, but that was my only real experience of a face-to-face -face tournament. And I'd played a lot of online. I sort of burnt out on that. But coming back from VWDC, it's been such a new and fresh experience. So many different players, so many different 
play styles. I mean, like my games in the Tour of Britain in particular were completely different to games that I've played in other tournaments. So I think that it is, it's like Saren said, it's really healthy right now. It's There's so many different players. There's so many different play styles. You've seen the meta where the AI are all ganged up on Turkey. That was a big thing for a while. And now that's changing. And now Turkey is getting good again. And it's, it, I think that cycle, from my experience online in the past, those cycles took a lot longer. You would go through a thing where if there was an anti-French meta on WebDip, for example, that meta would stick around for two or three years. And playing France was very, very boring in that time. But now this this seems to have accelerated that. So, OK, there was maybe a time where playing Turkey wasn't that enjoyable, but it's it's been snapped out of much faster. And I think that, that that's really good for the hobby as well. Like you don't have those games so much where you roll a certain country or a certain place and just know, oh, this is going to be a frustrating game. And if you do, then it's not something that's going to happen every time. It's going to it's going to change around a lot more. And I hope that that continues. Well, speaking of things that are really good for the hobby, I'll speak as the resident North American on this group to say it's awesome in the hobby to have people to play with that are not from the same geographic location. We talk about diversity in the hobby and different metas. And one of the best ways to do that is to play with people that are not exactly the same. And you can do that within a national hobby or, an, or, a, or a continental hobby, but it is spectacular to be able to do it in this virtual setting with you three and other folks from other parts of the world. So I appreciate you being on the show and thanks for your insights and happy stabbing. And thanks to all of you watching at home. We hope you have enjoyed this broadcast of Deadline. If you have news, ideas for features or feedback of any kind, please feel free to send an email to info at diplobn.com or you can always drop me a line directly at davidhood at dixiecon.com. For all of our other broadcast offerings, visit our website at diplobn.com. This is David Hood signing off. I wish you brightness and bliss and, of course, Belgium.